little competition going on here. <laughs> So Hilary, I'm just waiting for another couple of minutes until, actually it's only one minute now, just to see if anyone else joins the meeting. Um, otherwise, um, I'll just get going and it will just be a very few of us. Um, you can't talk, well you can if you want to, but I won't hear you, but you can type, so you just keep typing in your questions and I'll explain to you that I will, you, you can type in any questions that you like um, as I'm talking through the slides, but bear in mind that I'll, I won't answer them straight away because it gets really confusing and I can't really multitask like that. So I'll stop every three or four slides and there'll be an opportunity then to address the questions. So if I don't address your questions straight away, um, don't feel offended or anything. It just means that um, I, I haven't seen, it, seen them yet and I will address them you know, at, at several points throughout. Is that okay with you? Okay, all right. So I'll get started now because it is 10 past four and um, other people may join, I don't know, but we'll carry on anyway. So nice to see you people here. Thank you for joining the webinar. So this webinar is an introduction to a module that's going to be online very shortly. And um, the module is acting on information about your learner's writing. So next steps. Um, the webinar itself is second in a series and it follows on from the first webinar by Nikki McCartney. I don't know if you saw that, but that was Nikki McCartney's web webinar was knowing your learner's writing skills. And um, that and she also has a module that or has put a module up online there is a module up online as well that um, built well that provides far more information than, than what is in this the webinar um, but this webinar today is is really and the module is really providing you with information suggestions and strategies that are going to help you plan for your teaching so, and then following this, in a few weeks' time, I think, there will be another webinar by Polder Howe, and his webinar will go into the real detail of the actual teaching and, and will suggest specific strategies for helping your learners to improve their writing. Okay, so I just wanted to put it all in context for you. Can I have the... Um... <laughs> Sorry, I just need the mouse so I can move along. Okay, so this is, as I said, this is a, an overview of the key ideas in the module that will be up online. And in the module, there's a lot more detail, and there's going to be, there's audio, and there's also video clips as well. And then there's also opportunities for you to go away and try something out, and then come back to the module and carry on. So um, I, I hope it'll be well worth it for you. And I'd just like to mention also that at the beginning of each slide today, I will give you just a little time to read the slide so that I don't have to talk while you're reading because I know sometimes that can be a bit confusing as well. Okay, so really the, the five key ideas here that we're going to deal with today, um, and they pretty much stem around the big ideas of knowing the learner, um, and getting quite specific information about your learner or your learners, knowing the demands of texts and tasks, and knowing what to do. So that's the deliberate acts of teaching there in that fourth bullet point. Knowing what to do and then knowing what to do next. So knowing what to do after your teaching and seeing how it's gone. Um, just one other thing while I remember it, 
throughout the, the webinar and also in the module, I refer quite often to the Literacy and Numeracy for Adults assessment tool for writing, which is up online. But I also refer to the, the learning progressions for adult literacy, focusing on the right to communicate strand. And the one text that I have referred to quite a lot throughout is, is this one here, this green one. I hope you can see it, and I hope you've got it also. If not, um, you can get one from your organisation or from TEC. Um, teaching adults to write to communicate using the learning progressions. So I'll be referring to that quite often throughout. Okay, so let's begin with the learner. Knowing the learner, a very good place to start. Okay, so the big idea here really is that all learners have strengths. And I know sometimes it's quite hard when you're faced with a piece of writing that to you looks really bad and, and uh, its spelling might be poor or even, you know, the hand, you, you can get really distracted by handwriting actually as well. Um, you might not be able to find much in the way of structure or, or, or anything like that. But having said that, every writer, every learner does have strengths. So I'm really encouraging you to look at the glass as being half full rather than half empty. Um, and just to talk a bit more about this point, Jocelyn Cook, who was one of the key writers and the principal researcher for for ASA, one of the key writers and developers of that online assessment tool. Um, in the module, there's a little clip of her talking about a writer who wrote a piece of, who wrote a little piece called Goth, um, and she's describing how you have to search beneath all the surface features to see that this writer really does have wonderful ideas and, and really knows how to express them. Actually, I'm going to show you this little piece of writing right now. And I know it's hard to read, so just to um, exemplify what I'm saying, I'm going to read it to you. Okay, I think you'll agree that it's, it's probably reasonably hard to decipher and to interpret. Okay, so this is what it says. It says, hey sis, I was wondering if you would like to come to a goth get-together. We'll be meeting at the graveyard in Pakaranga at 12 o'clock and going to the ranch at 12.30. I think you should really come. I know you don't really like it, but I miss you and it's more fun when you're there. If you do come, remember to wear the corset and big hooded cape that you got in the mail. P.S. No parking, no cars, or you will have to leave it there till morning. So probably a bit of a sense of humour going on here as well. Um, but I think you would agree that certainly this writer is not devoid of ideas. This was a little writing piece that was used for the norming process, I think, for the um, online tool. I, I don't think you'll find it online, it's just one of the examples that they used. But certainly a great example of, of what I'm talking about. So really then, strengths are relative to the overall competence of a writer. Um, and they certainly don't have to sit at the top of the progressions to, to say that they've got strengths. Every writer will have strengths no matter where they sit. Um, so a strength is an area where the writer shows more confidence and, and more control as well. So more control and awareness of the actual skill that they're using in comparison to the other skills. Okay, and just feel free to ask any questions and I will answer them a little later on. Okay, so one way that I'm suggesting that you can really explore in a little more depth the strengths and the areas to work on of your learners is to develop a learner profile and to do this you really need to go into you really need to have several pieces of writing perhaps including an assessment but other writing that they've done for you um, a little diagnostic assessments or maybe a, a piece that they've done in, in um, a session with you um, and looking into the writing to see what it is that 
they do have control, some control over and some confidence in using and, and what areas they really don't. Um, they're using the progressions text, the green book that I just held up, suggests that there are three ways of gathering information, um, specific information on your learners. Uh, they talk about an attitude to learning survey, so that would be quite interesting to find out their, their, own, um, their own view of themselves as writers. Writing portfolios or journals. And using a diagnostic process based on the progressions. So these are all ways of gathering more information about your learner. Um, and then the profile, the profile would describe in more depth each of those specific skills that the writer has. Um, it's actually more useful for you to look at the actual writing in terms of informing your teaching than it is just to get the information from the from the reports that you might get, for instance, from the assessment tool. And that's because, for as an example, a, a writer might come out at around level three in text and language features, um, but that doesn't tell you exactly what it is that they need to learn. So by looking at their writing, you then might find that, okay, they might be including detail in their writing, which is what they need to be doing at level three, but perhaps their ideas aren't flowing, or vice versa. Uh, or they might not have good understanding of the features of different text types. So it's really worth going in and looking for that extra information. And then from that, you can work out what their next learning step is going to be. Another thing too is that when you develop profiles on your learners and, and you identify the next steps for them, um, you can then look at that across a whole group. And you, you might find, for instance, that across your whole group, however many there are, that many of them have similar needs or similar next steps. And that's really going to influence what you actually teach. So the more specific the information is about what your learners need to know and do, the more success you'll have in accelerating their learning or, or helping them to be more successful. So here's an example of what I mean by a profile. Um, and I, I have to confess that I didn't have lots of examples for this writer. I only had the one and it comes from an exemplar called Beyonce. Uh, from the assessment tool. So I just pulled this together as an example to show you what one would look like. Um, you can see there that in terms of the strengths for this writer, ideas, cohesion and basic spelling, okay so those are the things that the writing shows are, are pretty much in place at this level. Um, but the areas to work on on the right hand side show that improving sentence structure, audience awareness and correct use of punctuation are all areas to work on. So that's where the writing I guess would have been weaker. Um, now in terms of identifying the next step, remem remember, remember that the whole point of, of identifying strengths too, or another reason for identifying the strengths is, is that's what you build on to address the areas to work on. So in this case, this writer has got ideas and can even elaborate and extend them and also can get the writing to flow, so that's great. Um, on the right hand side you'll see that improving sentence structure and also developing punctuation are areas where this writer needs to, needs to work on. So for that reason, the next step, pulling that all together, would, would a good next step would be for this writer to learn how to write correctly formed and punctuated sentences. The ideas are already there, so there's something to build on. Um, and of course, punctuation, well punctuation should always be taught in the context of, um, of sentences or paragraphs anyway, it's not something you would teach in isolation. So. So it makes sense to have that as a next step for the writer. Okay, so also, um, 
I'd like to talk a little bit about developing goals, which seems to be the the, the next um, logical step for us to talk about. Okay, so three key ideas here really. The first one is about learners needing to have ownership of their own goals. Having ownership really helps them to focus on their own learning and for them to, to have some control also over what they're learning and what they're going to do next um, and what they can do to help themselves as well. Um, learners being aware of their own goals and then knowing what they can do to address those goals is really important in developing their metacognition which is really knowing what they need to learn and then knowing how to learn it and then knowing how they learn. So knowing the strategies that they can put in place that are going to help themselves as well. I, I think it's really a really good idea to share, share the profiles with the learners, talk about them with the learners, ask them if they agree or if there's anything they would like to add or, or, or um, change. Um, and then in some cases it may be perfectly appropriate to actually set the goals together. But if you don't set the goals with the learner, um, it's still really important to talk them through with them. A really important aspect of this too is talking about a time frame. So in other words, the goals that they have are probably, they're not goals for ever and ever, they're probably not even goals for a whole semester. Um, the goal that we talked about earlier, which was to write a correctly formed sentence with appropriate punctuation, um, that shouldn't take too long to get control of, you know, two to three weeks probably at the most. But you certainly wouldn't be thinking that that goal would still be there, you know, six, eight weeks later. So reflecting on the goals regularly is really important. And, and checking in to make sure that actually progress is being made against them. Um, and it goes without saying too that the profiles need to be updated. You know, as, as the learners make progress, you can highlight the specific areas that they are achieving and that's all, that also gives them a real sense of achievement too. Um, I've talked about individual goals but another really important aspect of helping your your learners is to have a is to share and make very clear the group goal for a particular session that you have with them, a lesson or a session, um, so that everybody knows what it is that they would be learning to do on that particular day. An example of that is that a goal for a whole group might be. Um, to write a letter of application that describes why an applicant would be good for the job. I mean, that's just, you know, a, a little example. Okay, so, if you've got any questions for me, feel free to ask any questions. Um, I have a question for you that if, if you'd like to just think about, you may not want to answer it, but um, certainly think about it. If on that little profile I showed you before that the writer of Beyonce just had one strength and it was in spelling, what what would you suggest as being the next step what, instead of the, the sentence one? So if you want to have a think about that, and, th and then I'll let you know what I think. <laughs> I'll flip back so you can have a look at the slide. There it is. Okay, well... I would think that in this case, if the only strength we could really identify was the spelling, um, and that would be quite unusual, I would imagine, but 
to just have one strength in spelling. But if that was the case, I wouldn't choose to writing correctly and correctly formed and punctuated sentences because to do that, you've really got to have ideas. You, you can't work with nothing. So I would say that if ideas weren't up there as a strength, that that would be actually the next step and the goal for the learner. Um, and that you and the learner or learners would work on that together. Um, and to do that, of course, there would be a lot of discussion and there would be a lot of opportunities that you would set up for learners to talk in groups about ideas and you would provide lots of um, um, ways of doing that with them. And perhaps even teaming up learners with each other um, on the base, you know, teaming up learners who do have good ideas with those who are struggling with that. So there's lots of ways that you can address that, but I think that would that would be the next step that I would choose. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about knowing the learner and getting more specific information for planning for your teaching. Now let's focus on the demands of the tasks and the texts. So there's a bit of a demand here also for the educator, isn't there? There's a demand that actually you will know, first of all, about the context that they need to write in and that you'll also know about what's expected of the learners, whether it's um, in a course that, that you're running or in the workplace. You need to have a pretty good understanding of what those demands are. Um, so finding as many examples of those of um, the text types is a re and then having a, a darn good read of them and trying to work that out, figure that out for yourself first is a really good step. Page six of the progressions, the using the progressions, the green book, explains, gives you more background and explains this in some detail. So I really encourage you to go there first and, and have a look at that. And they point out that points out that some tasks can be a lot more challenging than they look. And they give you a, an example of um, a task to explain how to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But when you think about it, to, to carry out that task, or to write about that task, you first of all need an understanding of the text and language features of procedural text. And you also need to know about how to write sequence steps. And you also need to know about imperative verbs as well. Um, but if, you were, if learners were required, say, to write a letter of application, they'd need to understand, first of all, the letter format. And they'd probably need to understand the text and language features of persuasive text. But they'd also need to know that within that text there's probably some explanation and some description going on as well and that the tone would be quite formal. So two quite different tasks there um, with, with different demands. So when we're talking about the, the tasks, we're talking about the purposes for writing and of course the texts are, are, the, um, are describing exactly what they'll be writing and how they'll be writing it. So let's have a look at the text demands next. Okay, so oh, I'll just give you a, a minute or two to have a read of this. Okay, so showing learners how a text works is, is a major teaching strategy. Um, it involves really deconstructing a text, so, so pulling it apart in a way, talking about or showing your learners what's actually happened in the construction of that text, going right in and examining the sentences, the vocabulary, thinking about why the writer has chosen 
to write things in the way they have, why they've chosen particular phrases, particular vocabulary, why they've organised it in, in the paragraphs in the way that they have, um, where they've added detail and information and how they've done that. So all of those things are really important to share with with learners and, and it's really kind of demystifying the text if you like or um, yeah, demystifying it and, and making it um, come alive in a way I suppose. Uh, good ways of doing this are you, you can have a, you could do it on a whiteboard, um, you could have a, a, a chart of it, an enlarged chart of it or you could actually have it on an OHT and it's a good idea to have some pens or markers and actually mark up the text, underline the phrases and the words and the vocabulary and, and annotate them in some way. And if you can, if, if it's at, at all possible, keep the copies of, of those texts and um, keep, bring them out you know, whenever they're needed or, or have them sitting there. At this stage I just want to remind you, you may already know, but there is a um, there are some texts that have been written especially for educators working with adult learners and they are produced by TEC and I think they're online as well and they're called collections and essentially they have been developed to support your learners with their reading but you may want to look at them also because they do give good examples of different sort of text types as well so that may be something for you to hunt out and, and um, search, search for. An important aspect of de deconstructing a text involves also developing the criteria so I just w want you to hold that thought because um, I'll be coming back to that in a few slides. But what I'm talking, about, what I'd like to talk about now is really the knowing what to do bit, and I want to talk about um, a really good approach that that you most likely already use. Um, I'd be interested to hear if if you do, and that's writing the text, co-constructing the text with your learners. This is an incredibly supportive thing to do because you're doing the writing, you've got the pen, um, but they are involved in every other way. They are interacting, they are making suggestions, they are talking together. Um, they, they can even evaluate what's been written. You might write a sentence and say, I don't really think that works, what do you think? Um, talk amongst yourselves and, and see if you can come up with a better word or, or a better phrase or a better sentence. Um, all, of, all of that is really, really supportive. So. There'll be lots of discussion and lots of interaction. You may want to write the whole text with your learners if you think they need that sort of support, or you may just want to write part of it and get them, ask them to then complete it in, in their peers or in their groups or even alone. So it's a very, a very supportive model, um, and it really allows you to model the sort of thinking that a writer or the writer of the sort of text that they need to write would be um, modelling the sort of thinking that that writer would have in their head. For instance, going back to that earlier goal which was about constructing a, um, forming a, a proper sentence, um, if you knew that more than half your group actually needed to do that, that's something that you could really model in the construction of the text together and you could choose you know, several opportunities to think out loud and show the learners what process you're going through to create that sentence so that that's something that they can do themselves too. So I talked a little before about developing the criteria for writing. Um, and f developing the criteria for writing f follows the deconstruction of the text. And there's that little picture of a lock there because it's, it's really about unlocking the text for the, for the learners. Anything that you can do to make explicit to them what they need to be writing and how they're going to write it is going to be really useful. 
So the criteria is like a little guide um, with a few pointers on it that that the learners can check against as they're writing and it can be used to help them as they're writing. It can be used for you to give them feedback on their writing. Um, but the self-evaluation part of it is really, really important. Not only self-evaluation, actually, they can, you can, they can use a, the criteria when uh, working together, like learners working together and peers or groups could evaluate their writing using the criteria as well. So it's a very, very useful and practical little process. So what do the criteria look like? Well, what they don't look like is a, is a list of 25 bullet points. Um, five to six is probably more than enough. So they need to be pretty specific and, and quite succinct as well. So here's an example of what a criteria might look like for um, the piece of writing I talked about before describing how to apply mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. So it would need a bit of an introduction, there would be a list of actions described in the correct sequence, imperative verbs used to introduce each action, and the present tense. So there's only four bullet points there. And of course, you, you would most probably develop it with your learners, and there may be other things that are needed to, to be in there as well. Depending on your learners, it might be that you want to say something about the sentences or the phrases that they write. So there's no right way, but listing the things that you think are important in the writing will be really helpful for them. So I'm stopping here again just to see if there are any questions that you have. Um, I'll just give you a couple of minutes to think about it. I'd be interested to see whether you, what experiences you've had actually in, in working with your learners and either ex exploring quality texts or, um, or writing or co-constructing texts with them. If there's anything you want to say or ask, feel free. Okay, so the last part of this webinar really carries on with the knowing what to do and it's about what we call deliberate acts of teaching. And the deliberate acts of teaching are the specific teaching actions that you carry out uh, because in response to exactly what it is that your learners need. Um, and by that I mean that in your group you will have a variety of, of um, different strengths and, and different needs as well or, or areas that they need to work on. And depending on your learners, um, you might need to model or think aloud, you know, f a lot of the time. You might need to give a lot of that support and, and let them in on your thinking so that they've got models in their heads over and over again of how to write a sentence or a paragraph or whatever it is. But you might also have learners who are pretty good at that, but, but they just need a bit of prompting them to, to remind them of what to do. Or with a simple explanation, they're fine. Or there may be some learners who need a lot of discussion before they're ready to write. Um, this might be true of, your, of English language learners, for instance. So. Being deliberate means knowing what it is that you need to do that's going to su support most of your learners and particularly when, if you are working with them one-to-one -one for any reason at all. Um, the two, two, there's two very powerful s deliberate acts of teaching there um, and that is modelling and giving feedback. There's a lot of research in the education sector, right across the sector 
to show that modelling and thinking aloud um, and, and giving feedback are very powerful because they're both about being very explicit, giving very explicit instruction and then giving explicit feedback about what they're doing, what they're doing right or what they're doing well, what they need to keep doing, what they need to do more of and what they need to change. So in the module there's actually quite a bit on um, both of those, there's examples of modelling and thinking aloud and there's, on, and there's also examples of giving feedback and so there's audio to support both of those. And while we're talking about support, there will be, of course, some writers, some learners, who will need even more uh, levels of support. And that's where frameworks for writing can be really, really helpful. So frameworks or, or templates, um, models, call them what you like, um, or sentence starters are all really good ways for providing support for those learners who just can't get started or, and, and need something extra. But maybe that that's what you need to model as well. You actually first of all may need to model how to use a template or an outline um, to get started with your writing and you might need to do that several times. In the using the progressions book, the green book, there is an appendix that gives you, Appendix C I think it is, on pages 71 to 73, and that gives you some examples and ways of getting started with frameworks, but I would imagine that um, you would want to develop your own that are related to the particular tasks that you've got for your writers, or that your writers need to be able to do. Um, and it may be, and of course the outline that you develop would need to outline the demands of the task and the text and also the criteria for the writing as well. And it may be that some learners actually just fill it in, that may be their starting point, or other learners may just use it as a guide alongside them. So again, there's no right way, it's whatever you need to do to support them, that, uh, th that's what matters. Um, for some learners, written prompts, such as sentence starters, can be really useful. Or statements or questions, just something to get them started. And the key thing to remember here is that over time you want your learners to become independent of you and, and also independent of, of any support or framework. Um, so just bear that in mind. Uh, it, it is something that you would expect over time they wouldn't need them, but at the beginning um, it, certainly, it certainly could really help some of them. Okay, now the final part of the webinar today is, is reflecting on learning. Um, and that's reflecting on the learning of your learners. It's asking yourself, did they achieve what I was expecting? What was the impact of my teaching? And asking those questions and looking for that impact or that evidence is one thing that we know really helps learners to progress. So. It's quite a good idea when you're planning a lesson or a session or whatever it is you're planning to do to also include in your planning um, part of your thinking maybe or you might jot it down some of the things that you will look for during the writing, during the lesson, during the session that will tell you that they're getting it, whatever it is, whatever it is. Um, and so then you can look for it and you can look for evidence of it. Um, for instance, if you were helping, if the focus of the teaching was for the learners to, do, to talk about and develop their ideas, then you'd be expecting to hear certain types of language and certain types of, of ideas or content um, coming through in their discussion. So you would know that you needed to look for that and then uh, you know, make sure afterwards that you're quite clear that you have 
people haven't heard that. So if the learning hasn't been as clear as what you hope as what you hoped, you know, it's no shame, no blame. Um, that's okay actually, and it's far better that you recognise that the learning hasn't had an impact and, and then thinking about what you're going to do straight away than um, just letting it slide. So some of the things that you might see, for instance, you might see that, um, or you might realise that you may need to break the teaching down into smaller steps. Well, you might realise that your, your instructions have been a bit confusing or actually you were a bit confused about what you were teaching. Um, there might not have been enough time to discuss a model in depth or you might not have been explicit enough. Um, you know, it can be quite hard to admit and it's quite easy to blame the learners, isn't it? But actually, generally, it's, it's the teaching that needs to change. So take that time to think about the results and taking that time and then planning what you will do, planning how you'll modify your teaching, will have really good long-term benefits for your learners. And you'll get better at it over time. I promise. So um, that's pretty much everything that I'm going to cover today. Um, thank you very much for joining the webinar, especially you, Hilary. Um, remember that a full version of this webinar will be available online and the, the module that will be up there very soon and you'll be able to go through it at your own pace and carry out the activities and, and learn things in your own time. So in the meantime, um, I, I've finished but if you would like to ask me any questions please feel free to do so. I'll be here for a couple of more minutes. But if you want to leave the meeting now, that's fine also, because um, I, I have finished. Okay, thanks Hilary, and um, good luck, good luck with your teaching. Thanks Hilary, goodbye.